Gibson and Epiphone appear to just be plucking prices out of thin air. I've lived with this for a week now and I will tell you right away, it is really nice. I really like it. I won't say I love it because the cost is a big part, isn't it? And Epiphones are not meant to be 1,500 quid. Bonamassa said it himself, didn't he? Epiphones are for the kids. So many people in comments have already criticised this guitar because it's got Epiphone Pro Bucker pickups in it. Charge £1,500 for an Epiphone, expect to be criticised for things that you haven't got right. If you've got one, well, well done, congratulations. <laughs> it must be minted. Hello, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Guitaristas. Of course I got one, as so many of you predicted last week. I spoke about this in my last week's film, the new Joe Bonamassa Epiphone SG Custom. Or as I like to call it, the new eye-wateringly expensive SG Custom from Epiphone. It cost me £1,500. 1,499 English pounds to be precise, for an Epiphone, okay. Um, that includes tax in the UK, 20% tax, I should say that. In the US of A, this is costing 1,400 US dollars plus tax, depending which state you live in, I believe. Canada, I think it's 1,700 Canadian dollars. In uh, Europe, which the UK used to be a part of, 1,500 euros. And in Australia, 2,800 Australian dollars. Ouch. Yeah, it smarts, doesn't it? It smarts because as nice as it is, and I've lived with this for a week now, and I will tell you right away, it is really nice. I really like it. I've been playing it all week. Uh, I won't say I love it because the cost is a big part, isn't it? It's got some faults as well, which we'll go through. Uh, a few things, you might be surprised. But, yeah, it's a great guitar. But it's, it's an Epiphone and it shouldn't really be costing £1,500, in my humble opinion. So, anyway, I nearly didn't get it, but as, you know... As you all know, I was going to, because it's an SG. It's an SG Custom. I don't have one. And um, it's shiny, isn't it? So <laughs> there's no way I wasn't going to get it. But it was, you know, well, I, had to, I had to think twice about it because of, the, cause of the, the crazy cost. We'll talk more. I'm going to try and not talk too much now because you probably want to see it. I did unbox this, however, last weekend on the TV channel. And that was funny because, uh, well, I'll show you a little clip. This is my reaction. Okay. My initial impressions. Um, I'll be honest with you, my initial impressions, I'm holding a really expensive Epiphone. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't really know what more to say. I, I thought... Yeah, this is not going to be a good review, is it, if, if, if my mindset is like this. But that's how I feel, you know, when you, when you get... Well, you can tell by my reaction, can't you? you? You're excited. And I'm just suspicious. I'm just suspicious. It was surprising because I didn't even really kind of look at the guitar and take it in. It was just I had that sense that this is... <laughs> we're being shafted. Oh, well, that's the way I felt. That was the Im initial emotion. Not, oh, look at this, this is brilliant. It's like, oh, look at this, how much was it? So anyway, what we're going to do today is we're going to review it, we're going to take it apart and find out if it's worth it, really. Yeah, go through all the good bits and some bad bits and play it loads. 
and uh, yeah, try and work out. Try and work out, just try and work out if it's worth it, really. Um, I mean, I know what the answer's going to be. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're in a hurry, it's going to be, it's worth it if you want it. If you can justify spending that money on it. And uh, there's going to be people that will add up all the bits and go, oh, look, it's got a case. Oh, look, it's got this, it's got that, it's got, it's going to be worth £7,000 in a year's time. <laughs> and there are going to be others that are go, it's bollocks, isn't it? It's £1,500 as an Epiphone. It's nice, but it shouldn't cost that much. So together, we're going to find out. If you're in a hurry, don't forget, timestamps are in the description box. You can skip forward to hear what it sounds like or whatever it is interests you. You've got a little bit of time on your hands. Go and put the kettle on. Open the drinks cabinet. Make yourself a nice little sandwich. And come back and join us and chill out and we'll get stuck in and we'll have a good old um, all natter about it, really. So, yeah, cool. Let's do it. Okay, ready? Let's do it. So, <laughs> first, I'll just show you this. Well, the case, you can see. Well, you saw the case. It's got the Nerdville stuff on it. It's got this gold plush lining, which is very nice. And it's got the certificate of authenticity there, Joe Bonamassa. There you go. So, now let's just lose the case so you can see the guitar properly. The case, of course, very much an acquired taste, all this. I'll be honest with you, I felt a right plonker taking that home. Anyway, here it is. Dark wine red SG Custom. It, it's a lovely looking guitar, isn't it? It's, just, it's not really any two ways about it. it. It's pretty unique as well because obviously Joe Bonamassa's original that this is based on was a, was a custom order, a one-off. So, you know, getting... It's a lovely, it's a lovely, <laughs> it's a lovely thing. It's a lovely thing. It really is a lovely thing. It is a lovely thing. Whatever way you look at it, it's a lovely thing, unless you think about how much it costs you. And that is really, it, it kind of, it's, it really does skew it because as much as I like this, I like the idea of it, everything about Epiphone, I like Epiphone, I love Epiphone, you know that. I've, I've <laughs> as I said last week, I've, I've shouted from the rooftops about how good Epiphones can be. And so I'm quite prepared to also sh shout about how ridiculously expensive this is for what it is. Two years ago today, I bought the Joe Bonamassa Lazarus Les Paul for £799 two years ago. This today, £1,499. That's a remarkable increase, a £700 increase, isn't it? This one I don't think is a limited edition. Some people are saying it is, but I can't see that listed anywhere, not on the Epiphone website, certainly not on any of the dealer websites. So having said that, we all know that this is going to sell out damn quick. Seems to be sold out in places I've looked in the US, in Canada. UK, there's still still plenty available at the moment. In uh, I know Andertons have got some, and I know Guitar Guitar have got some. As of today, what's today? It's the third of October today when I'm shooting this. So, uh, look, you know, if you if you fancy one, and you can justify the <laughs> expense, I do get one because it's a great guitar. It's a great guitar, as I said. I don't think it's going to be the sort of thing that you can justify as an investment necessarily. I know Joe Bonamassa's signatures do tend to go up in value. That's not of any interest to me whatsoever because I want good value from a guitar when I buy it, not in five or ten years' time. I'm not really interested in that. It's not why I buy guitars. If it happens, it's it's a nice. It's a happy accident, but don't don't go buying this because you think it's an investment. Because 
That never works out, really, does it? It never works out. Something's bound to go wrong. You know, they'll just keep banging these out till the cows come home, probably. And eventually the price will drop. Maybe. Maybe they won't. Anyway, should we, should we do some specs? Right. So it's a mahogany body. This looks a little bit like a veneer on the back. It's not. I will say it's just a two-piece mahogany body and this figurine is obviously in the wood. It's a poly finish. It's got a mahogany neck with a ebony fingerboard and a medium jumbo fret. We'll have a closer look at those in a minute. For now, let's, um, let's put the neck profile and measurements up on the screen so you can have a look at those. Okay, here's the neck profile and measurements at the first fret. And here's the neck profile and measurements at the 12th fret. So slim taper C, it's nice and comfortable. Uh, I don't know if I said there's a poly finish on this guitar, so it just feels like a, a poly finish. Not especially nice, but a normal really, I suppose, if you're used to these things. Um, let's go up the headstock end. It's got these waffle, Cluson waffle style, waffle style tuners. They look nice, don't they? You'll see these on the 68 Customs, Gibson Les Paul Customs, and presumably earlier. Well, obviously they're, obviously they're period correct because that's the style that Bonamassa had on the original. Um, and oh, and if you missed that, this is based on a 1963 SG Custom that Joe Bonamassa owns, which was a um, a custom order in this beautiful dark wine red. And that's one of the things about this guitar that once I'd taken it home and, and stuck it on the wall and played it and looked at it a lot, it's a definite <laughs> perv on it guitar, you know, all the time. Every time you walk past it, you go, oh, that's nice. Yeah, I like that. Under your breath like that, you know, so no one can hear you. But I do do it out loud. Anyway, here it is. It's got the the Epiphone Kalamazoo headstock, which is probably the biggest fault on this guitar for fifteen hundred pounds. It'd be nice if you had the Gibson headstock. I said last week, I said, oh, Gibson could knock one out for two grand, couldn't they? Well, well, they probably could if they wanted to, couldn't they? Anyway, it's got um, it's as you can see, it's got this kind of dark coloured amber binding on the headstock which doesn't match the binding on the neck which is quite quite slightly off-white i read somewhere that that's because that's the same on the original don't know if that's true or not didn't check but anyway yeah it's got so it's slightly off-white binding there and what i noticed was that then you've got a different colour white um, pit guard and custom plate. I just noticed that wonky screw there. Oh, I'll photograph that for you. There you go. Wonky screw there. Um, yeah, different colour pit guard and different colour switch tip knob. And um, you've got the, the Maestro Vibrola. And as you can see, this has been branded Epiphone. These are good for, or these are, these are not a problem for tuning stability. I don't use them a lot. Every now and then I might give it a little warble. But it's really, for me, I love them from an aesthetic point of view. And they don't, ha they don't seem to have any, um, or they don't seem to cause any tuning issues. This tuning stability on this has been really good. All week, I've been playing it all week, and I, do you know what? I, I can't remember actually having to retune it. I really can't. So that's good. It's got the um, Epiphone Tone Lock, or Lock Tone, I can never remember. Lock Tone. It's got the Epiphone Lock Tone bridge. That's a bridge, isn't it? With nylon saddles. 
And Bonamassa says in, in his, um, in his uh, launch video for Epiphone, give them a chance because they give it a nice warm sound. And I tend to agree, they do give it a nice sound. Or, or they certainly contribute to this sounding really good, which we'll hear in a bit. After we've taken the strings off, had a closer look at all the frets and stuff, and um, and then what we'll do is we'll we'll take some pickup readings and we'll we'll have a look under these pickups, and of course inside the control cavity, all the stuff and that. Before we do that, let's weigh it. Here we go. Seven pound fifteen ounces. This one which is 3.6 kilos. So that's good. Uh, you know, you can feel it's got a bit of weight to it. SGs can often be lighter than this. But uh, it's it's decent weight, isn't it? Okay, just before I take these strings off, let's just measure what the action was out of the box or out of the case. Don't know if this was set up by the shop or not. I don't know if you can see that. It's, uh, it's a little on the high side for me. Three, 360 force on the base side is my kind of, or a little bit above that. This is quite a little bit above that. And on the treble side, 132. And in metric, that's uh, one mil on the treble side and one and a half mil on the, the base side. And there's a little bit higher than that, which, which I could feel, but it wasn't to the point where it was, it made it difficult to play. Um, and in fact, it, it, in fact, in fact, in fact, in fact, it felt that. It felt right. It felt all right. I felt that maybe it was a little bit high on the nut as well. But anyway, certainly playable out of the box. So, um, yeah, no... No strikes for that. No buzzing. No buzzing on the frets anywhere. Let's get the strings off and and, and then we'll talk about something that I did notice. Right, let's have a look at the fingerboard and frets. The board, as I as I said, it's it's ebony. That looks the part, doesn't it? So they got that right. The frets are medium jumbo. And as I said, no buzzing, so the setup was fine. But I did notice some sharpness. And it's actually on, it's not on this side. It's on this side here. It's there. And I noticed it actually when I was picking the guitar up, because I tend to grab it there off the wall. And I go, oh, blimey. You can hear that. Now I'm going to try... I'm going to try something now. I don't even have my hand or going. You know, Philip McKnight, he uses his tights or whatever they are. Socks, aren't they? Socks to, to test the fret ends. You've seen it. And I'm going to just try a jiffy bag because it was handy and I thought that might work. It probably won't. Let's try it. This I can feel is really sharp. Here you go. Hey, it worked. See that? Oh, look, it's stuck on there. Yeah. Yeah, there's a bit of sharpness there. I suppose it happens. Just thought I'd mention it. It would be very easy to just deal with that. Honestly, just get a little get a little sanding block and just rub it along there a couple of times. You won't do any damage and it'll just get rid of that sharpness there. You know, that's not necessarily something you'd expect to find on a 1500 pound guitar <laughs> what else so what else for, i've got some like, there's a couple of little faults that i thought i'd mention we've covered the binding color i mean that was a it's just a thing it's just like an attention to detail thing isn't it now let's look at the horns <laughs> let's look at the horns because as as you know and as you know, if, if you saw a, a, a video I did on the Epiphone 61 SG, I was complaining about the, the lower bevel shape. And this is, 
This is different, actually. Well, actually, while I'm talking about that, I should point out it's got a, a quite a unique, smooth contour on the on the neck heel there, which is again unique to Joe's original. So that's that's great. They've they've recreated that smooth, you know, accurate, perfect accuracy to the original. However, they <laughs> they seem to have missed something. I'm laughing because. As you can see on this, it's what I like to call the wide horn. It's the wide horn version of the SG. The upper horn, in fact, the, the lower horn as well, they're, they're quite wide. Now, I'll show you what some SGs are like. A lot of SGs are like that with the wide horn. Some SGs, however, are like this. I'll show you another one. This is my Gibson SG standard that I bought what, about a month ago for 1,500 pounds. And look, you can see this has got a narrower upper horn and lower horn, which is quite normal as well. You know, it varies on between models and I'm not sure if there's a right way or a wrong way. I think the narrower is right. And as it happens, as you can see from these pictures of the original from Joe Bonamazza, it's got a narrower upper horn. Yet... They didn't recreate that on this. It's got the wider horn. Just saying, it's attention to detail, isn't it? If you're, <laughs> if you're charging £1,500 and you're going to claim that it's because you've put all this effort into it, you should get the body shape right, really, shouldn't you? I'm sorry that I'm being so cynical. It's only about the price. It's not about... The guitar being anything wrong with being the guitar, apart from you know silly minor things that are you know, and a summit and nothing really. It's just about charge fifteen hundred pounds for an Epiphone. I expect it to be criticised for things that you haven't got right. So many people in comments have already criticised this guitar because it's got Epiphone Pro Bucker pickups in it. And it should have burst buckers, and they're saying, if you're going to charge that amount, at least put Gibson burst buckers in it, which is what everyone expected. And in fact, um, I think it was on the Anderton's website, it was listed as having Gibson burst buckers. There you go. I took a screenshot of that. Um, but of course it hasn't. It's got pro buckers. So that was just a silly mistake that someone made. Anyway, so this has got Epiphone Pro Bucker 2s in the neck and the middle position and an Epiphone Pro Worker 3 in the bridge. So let's take the reading, shall we? Now, the pickup switching, I've just realised I'm not going to be able to measure the middle one because what we've got is in the treble position, you've got the bridge pickup only. In the rhythm position, you've got the neck pickup only. And in the middle position, you're getting the middle pickup and the uh, bridge pickup together. So um, we're on a reading of that already. That's given us a reading of 4.06K in the middle position and an inductance of 2.44 Henry's. Let's go to the bridge pickup and we've got 8.33K and uh, the inductance is 4.88 Henry's. And then if we go to the neck pickup, again, 7.97K or 4.48 Henry's. So nice uh, kind of vintage -y readings there, sort of PAF-like readings, I think. I think I'm right in saying that. And I certainly, from just from playing it at home, I felt... I felt they were quite low output, but sounded nice as well. So I'm looking forward to plugging it in a little while to seeing if that's sort of, they represent that way as well through the Princeton. We should be able to hear that. There you go. So should we have a quick look underneath? Take it apart. Let's take all the plastic off. And then, all right. So two volume, two tone. As I said earlier, the middle position operates middle and the bridge pickup together. Treble, just that one. Rhythm, just that one. And also, they're in phase. On Joe's original, 
he says, unusually, these two, are, they're often out of phase and unusual when they're, we're on together. But in his original, they're not, they weren't. Uh, so uh, they aren't. Yeah, they're not. They're not. So neither are these. And they're usable, as we'll hear in a bit. After we've had a poke around underneath them. So let's do that now. Let's take all the plastic off. Let's take the whitey pit guard off. I might take the plastic off of that at the same time. You can see I've been playing it because it's all started to ruffle. I nearly said rankle. It's not the word, is it? Here's that wonky screw. I thought we might see a neck tenon there, but we can't. The neck joint. I think we can see joint. Let's get the pickup out and see what's under there. That's what a custom looks like inside. It's got quite flimsy. Little bit of wood between the, the pickups there. I don't know if I expected there to be any wood there. I thought maybe, maybe not. But yeah, that's what that looks like. And uh, here you go. Joe B S G Cus D W R uh, wine red, dark wine red, isn't it? This. There you go. Um, yeah, I can think we can see the the neck tenon comes through to there. Oh, and right down to there. There you go. You can see that. So, quite robust. I imagine with that extra smooth contour, it, it probably need to be, wouldn't it? Because there's not a lot of wood there, is there? Anyway, there you go. Um... Pro Bucket, I'm going to be smart now. I'm going to try and be smart. <laughs> Pro Bucker 2 Gold Humbucker Neck C for coaxial cable. There you go. Coaxial cable. Pro Bucker 2 Gold Humbucker Me Mid Middle C for coaxial. Pro Bucker 3 in the bridge Gold Humbucker bridge, C for coaxial. Yes. It's, it's taken us three years, best part of three years, but we've cracked the code. There you go. And as we already knew, inside there, it's got CTS branded. There you go. You can see that CTS there. Um, I'm guessing they're 500k pots. Got some Mallory capacitors on there. And it's got a switchcraft knob, <laughs> switch, and jack in this. So all good, all good quality stuff in there. Right. And finally, I wanted to just show you truss rod cover. Um, look at this. Wonky screws. It always makes me laugh, that. And there's the uh, Alan Wrench style truss rod. And there's dual action, by the way, according to the specs. There you go. I'm going to put it all back together now. We'll put some new strings on it and, and we'll plug it in, see what it sounds like. See you in a minute. Here we are. Unplugged. Sounds nice. Sounds nice and bright. These maestros always tend to give it quite a, a sort of a bright, airy sound. 
Anyway, so, uh, yeah, yesterday before I went home, I just sort of set this rig up. I just have to move a few things around, put me board down there, move the flight case, come workbench out of the way. And I plugged it into the Princeton just to, just to get a feel for what it was sounding like. As I suspected, quite low output pickups. Sound nice, but they weren't pushing the tubes as hard as I wanted. What I'm trying to do, <laughs> yeah, what I'm trying to do is recreate the sound that Joe Bonamassa got in, in the Epiphone demo of this, basically, which is quite a, a dark bluesy, quite a raunchy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't pushing it quite hard enough. So I normally have the Princeton on sort of around about seven and a half, maybe eight, with the ox attenuator, obviously. Um, so anyway, I thought well, I'll, I'll just tweak it up a little bit today, see if I can get that nice sound. So I ended up cranking it to 10, and um, it was sounding pretty good. Um, but then <laughs> the amp crapped out on me. It just was sort of, there was a weird sort of a bzzing noise, and then it just went completely dead. So, yeah, I have appear to have blown the Princeton up. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is. I look, the tubes are still sort of glowing, so I don't know if it's a valve or something more serious. So we're not using the Princeton today. Uh, fortunately, well, fortunately, I've got loads of other amps to choose from. Um, and I mucked around with a few to sort of give me the sound I was looking for. It's surprising, as, as I, I think I said the other week, how amps can have a really distinct voice of their own. And going through a few, I used to do it every week before I got the Princeton, trying to find an amp that worked with the guitar. This worked with everything, but I tried the Super Reverb. Wow, that's got a sound of its own, you know? Vox AC30s, they've got a sound of their own. Uh, a lot of amps have got a sound of their own. What I ended up choosing is a new little, a new, new to me, Marshall Studio Silver Jubilee that I just bought off my mate Paul from Paulie's Guitars and Gear. So it's there, and I'm going to take a shot of it for you. The little Marshall Studio Silver Jubilee, it's a lovely little amp. It's got a, a clean channel, and it's got a, a high gain channel. We're on the clean channel. What I've ended up doing, and I'll take a shot of the amp now for you so you can see, is cranking it completely. So the channel volume's on 10. <laughs> And, um, or the input gain, I think I'm right in saying this, you can have a look for yourself. The input gain is on 10, and the cha and, and the, the, the volume is on 8, I think. And obviously I'm using the ox attenuator. And this is in the 20 watt mode, okay. So it's, again, it's cranked. Um, and obviously the, the gain channel on this is too gainy. I might, I'll show you later. Anyway, so that's what I'm using. Um, there's a shot of the settings. On the pedal board today, I'm not using any pedals. I have got the uh, the Holy Grail reverb, though, because there's no reverb on this amp. So that's where we are. <laughs> what I'm going to try and do now is play this thing, and uh, we can see what it sounds like. So we turn the amp on. It's hissing quite a bit because it's cranked so much. <laughs> so... Uh, I thought I'd turn it off until I was ready. Here we go. This is what, well, this is what the guitar sounds like. Let's try and, um, let's try and do something. <laughs> bridge pickup with the tone rolled back to oh, about five and a half as Joe suggests roll it back let's roll it up and it's like um <laughs> Takes the edge off a little bit. It's quite nice, isn't it? The rhythm pickup, the neck, 
Is that the front or back? I don't know. I don't know. Front? Let me know. It doesn't matter. It's not important. Um, cranked quite a bit. Tone up, here we go. So that was some, hopefully, Bonamassa style tones for you from the Bonamassa SG Custom. Did anyone notice I was trying to copy some of his licks from the Epiphone promo? He's a very good guitarist. It's, it's not easy. I'll be honest with you, it's not easy for me anyway. Uh, and people give him a hard time, but he's really good and a fabulous ambassador for guitar. Guitar. Guitarist, you know. Make sure, this is actually a Noel Gallagher quote, but he said this about Johnny Marr, but I'm now saying it, I'm stealing it, and I'm saying it about Joe Bonamassa. It makes you feel good to be in the guitar community. I think so. And of course, Bonamassa, you know, he's been doing these Epiphone signatures for, I think this is about the 11th one or something like that. So for over a decade, I think. If that's correct, it might not be. You don't need to correct me. It's something like that. Yeah, but so he was probably, again, I haven't checked this. It's not, it's not a fact, but he was probably one of the first doing Epiphone signatures. And then, and obviously, lately, everyone's jumped on board, haven't they? This, this is great. I mean, it, as far as this one goes, it, you know, it, it, it's well-deserved. It's part of a long running series, but they've just whacked the prices up recently. They've just got silly with the prices. As I said earlier, I paid seven nine nine for the Lazarus Les Paul just two years ago this month. So this has gone up 
Let me get it right. Seven hundred pounds. It's not double, but it ain't far off double. Which I'd I'd like to, I'd honestly like to find out how they justify that. You know, if you're watching, let me know. <laughs> how do you justify that that amount of increase? Apart from the fact that lately Gibson and Epiphone appear to just be plucking prices out of thin air for all sorts of crazy, crazy things that they do. I think, I think there's a lot of passion projects. That's what they call them in telly. Passion projects coming out of Gibson. It's like some, it's like almost like some high-ranking CEO there as as kind of releasing all of these crazy guitars from his mates, you know. Guitars that not necessarily people <laughs> not necessarily want to buy. Flying V's. A lot of Flying V's coming out there, isn't there? Dave Mustaine and even a ridiculously expensive Adam Jones one has just been uh taunted. Taunted, that's the word. Taunted on Instagram. Very cool Dave taunted us with that. Twenty grand for an Adam Jones Flying V. When, you know, his high priced Epiphone series <laughs> I think it's seven. I keep saying it's 17, but I think it's seven. And I think they've released five now. And two of them are on discount offer and, and are not selling. So maybe someone dropped a bollock there. I'm not sure. Um, lots of high-priced Epiphone signatures that I haven't bought. The last Bonamassa, three, is it a 335 three, or 345, 355? Three, I can't remember. But I didn't buy that because it was too expensive. Um, amongst many others. This one I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist because it's an SG and it's an SG custom. So this is designed for people like me that have to have it. Although, <laughs> I actually, I said I wasn't going to buy it. Would I have bought it if it went for the channel? Maybe. Maybe I would have weakened. I think I would have hung on and, and seen if the price had dropped at all, though. Although I do, I do predict that this will be sold out and unavailable unless they make more. Um, Toman are showing them as pre-order and, and another batch coming in, so maybe they're not a limited edition. Doesn't say they're limited edition anywhere. We'll see. But this, as far as this one goes, well, all right. Let's let's stop waffling and and get to the crux of the matter. Is it worth it? Is it worth? Fifteen hundred pounds I paid. Fourteen hundred ninety-nine pounds. I paid for it. Is it worth it? No, I don't think it is. Unless you really want this guitar. Why? Look, okay. I don't think this is a premium product. It, it's a Chinese-made Epiphone. Not that there's anything at all wrong with guitars that are made in China, but we all know that they're made at a cost. It's a it's a production line guitar, okay? This, it's not a premium product. There's nothing that sets this apart from any of the other inspired by Gibson range that I've reviewed many over the years. The Ebony SG Custom, for instance, which is around about 500 pounds. There's nothing that sets this apart Apart from the fact that it's got an extra pickup, um, well, and slightly different parts. So it's not as if they paid any more attention to detail to this particular one, as has been demonstrated, I think, by various faults, wonky screws. You know, sharp frets, <laughs> wonky screw, and all right, yeah, they've and they've got the the <laughs> the horn a bit wrong. So yeah, I yeah, I mean, it's not as if it's not as if you're saying, oh yeah, well, look, it's handmade guitar, so of course it's worth that amount of money. It's not. There's a premium. So that's what I think. I don't think it is worth the money. I think it's a great guitar. And I think if you want one, if you've got one, great. Because you won't be disappointed. You will not be disappointed with the guitar. 
it looks great, it sounds great, but you'll have exactly that feeling that I got when I unboxed it. You'll be going, yeah, but it's a 1500 quid Epiphone. And Epiphones are not meant to be 1500 quid. The whole point of Epiphone, as far as I was concerned, Bonamassa said it himself, didn't he? Epiphones are for the kids. Their tagline is for every stage. Well, this is this is bypassing the audience that the Epiphone have built over the years, in my humble opinion, and, and alienating so many people. And, and you only have to look at the comments on, you know, the Instagram posts and the Epiphone promos to see that whilst there's this this um this this crazy support of people with <laughs> going oh yeah brilliant epic shit man there's so many people going what the fuck you know i feel so strongly about this because i think you know only you know, in the last 3 years um, okay in 2019 they they relaunched the brand really didn't they with with the kalamazoo headstock and the inspired by gibson range and that coincided in, well, in 2020, when I launched this channel, I bought a load and um, sung their praises because there was such good guitars. And at that point, a lot of people still remembered the Epiphone of old, which although were good, they weren't, or most of them weren't, a, um, a patch on what they created, you know, with the Inspired by Gibson range. So... At that point, they were kind of fighting a battle to, to change people's opinion of the quality of, of Epiphone guitars. And I feel, genuinely feel that I, I helped that. I know I've got a lot of you bought Epiphones because, because of what I'd said about them, you know, how good they were. I reviewed loads on the channel to the point where people thought that Epiphone was sponsoring the channel. And they weren't. I just liked the guitars and I liked the prices. Where you could go out and for around about five hundred pounds or less, you could buy a brilliant uh, alternative to the expensive Gibsons, and and I feel quite annoyed, upset. I don't know. I just feel a bit shafted that that, that they've now kind of gone. Oh, good people love our guitars now, so let's put the prices up and try and create something that maybe they're not. I obviously feel strongly about this. And I think it is because I was so supportive of what they were doing just a couple of years ago. And now it seems very quickly they turned a corner. It, it seems to me that they got greedy and every opportunity they get to whack something out that they think will appeal to whoever it appeals to, they whack a massive price tag on it. And I don't I don't buy the fact that it's because the artist gets a load, because I don't think the artists do get a load. They might get 10%, but I don't think they get any more than that. So you can't justify something like this by saying, oh, well, Joe's probably getting $300 out of it, because I just simply don't believe that, that would be the case. So... Well, I don't, I don't know where that leads us. Uh, well, it's an expensive Epiphone. Is it worth £1,500? No, definitely not. It's a great guitar. It's worth eight or £900 in today's market. And I would willingly have paid that and said, well, it's great. Although a couple of years ago, I was moaning that Lazarus cost £800. Oh, it was. Two years ago, I was moaning that Lazarus cost £800. When at that point... Les Paul standard 50s and 60s were under 500 pounds. So all of a sudden it's, ooh, are they getting a bit tasty? Apparently so. And that's rocketed. That's rocketed, isn't it? So I'm really moaning, aren't I? God, sorry, guys. <laughs> look, yeah, well, look, I love it anyway. And I did say when I unboxed it, I said, I'm going to flip this but I don't think I am because I really like it. But every time I play it, I'll be remembering how much it cost. 
And I suppose the other thing is, if I do need to, if I need to raise a, a thousand pounds, I can probably sell this, can't I? So I suppose it will be in the firing line for, for flipping if I don't end up playing it. That sometimes happens as much as I like a guitar. I haven't played it. It will go. Anyway, <laughs> I think that's enough, don't you? Um, there you go. That's what I think of the, well, that's what I think of Epiphone. What I think of the Epiphone Joe Bonamassa 63 SG Custom is, it's fucking great, isn't it? Look at it. It's good. I thought it sounded good. And um, if you've got one, well, well done. Congratulations. <laughs> it must be minted. If, you, um, if you'd like one but can't afford it or couldn't afford it, let me know. Let me know in the comments what you think, as always. Do you think I'm just moaning pointlessly for the sake of YouTube? Some people do. They'll say that about the thumbnail. they say, oh, you're just doing that to get views. Well, of course, I'm putting the thumbnail on there to try and get views. But actually, what I've said in this film is actually what I think, all right? It's, uh, it's my opinion because I paid for this out my own money. And it hurts. It hurts. So, yeah, there. That's it for this week. Thanks for enduring. If you're still here, well done. Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be back next week with something else. And I'll try and, um, I'll try and be more positive about whatever it is I do next week. I haven't decided yet. So come back, same time, same place next week. I'll look forward to your company. Until then, cheers. Ta-da. <laughs>